Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Viktor Munarski. I'm a postdoc in Josh Magdermott's lab for computational audition, and I'd like to welcome you all to this CBMM special seminar organized by our trainee council. Um, it's not an exaggeration anyway to say that it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Joseph Litzier from University of Sydney. Joe's academic career was slightly nonlinear in that after graduating from university, he went on for, <coughs> to work in industry for a couple of years as a research engineer. And uh, then his growing curiosity uh, drew him back into the bowels of academia, where he did his uh, PhD in Mikhail Prokopenko's group at ICT Institute of CSIRO, which is Australian uh, Research Agency, uh, while in parallel working in industry. Uh, after graduating, he went on to do his postdoc in Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig, Germany, where we met. I was a beginning PhD student, Joe was a postdoc, good times. And uh, after going back to Australia, uh, Joe got a job as a, as a senior lecturer, which he holds until now, at the University of Sydney. Uh, academically, Joe is uh, interested in understanding structure and function of, of complex systems. And his weapon of choice is information theory. Uh, Joe made many fundamental contributions to our understanding of very fundamental and subtle concepts, such as uh, transfer entropy and recently partial information decomposition, which is a hotly debated topic in the field. And uh, Joe does not live only in the abstract world of, of theory and abstract ideas. He's very interested in, in applying them and verifying them in, in many domains of natural science, in particular in neuroscience, uh, which I guess is something we're going to hear a few words today about. Um, I should also tell you that all his friends from Max Planck Institute remember Joe as an avid sports fan and a champion grill master, which I'm told is an Australian national virtue. Uh, please give a <laughs> warm welcome to Dr. Joseph Litzier. Yeah. Thank you, Victor, for that very nice introduction. And I'm going to start with an apology uh, that I'm not going to do any work on the barbecue today. So I'm sorry to disappoint everyone after that, but uh, that's not what is going to happen. What is going to happen is that we're going to talk about how information is processed uh, in brains. So as Victor highlighted, uh, I'm a complex system scientist. I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, I do have uh, the pleasure and uh, the, the, the pleasure and privilege, privilege to work with some very good neuroscientists uh, who, uh, you know, together we can work out uh, what experiments we could do to highlight the role of information processing and they can do the interpretation on the neural side. So if I make some mistakes on the neural interpretation today, uh, certainly I can point you to the papers where they've expressed uh, that side of things much more clearly than I can. So what I will talk about is a view of information processing in terms of how information is stored, how it's transferred and how it's modified in complex systems. Uh, the talk is going to focus on the first half on this sort of philosophical or, or this philosophical view of how we can quantify these operations on information in complex systems. And then the second half is going to be a uh, kind of a helicopter view of how we can then use that in a computational neuroscience setting. So to kind of summarize what the high level questions are that this can help us answer and then to give you some examples, some very brief examples of, of how we do that. Okay, so let's start thinking about information processing or, or computation. So in computer science, the, the primary view about computation is, is to look at Turing machines, which are the, the primary theoretical or, or abstract model of what computation is. As, uh, as hopefully everyone in the room knows, uh, Turing machines are deterministic state machines that operate on an infinite tape. They read a value from the tape under the, the head where they currently are, they make a decision, on what to do based on that input and, and what's in the program of the machine. They write something back to the tape and they move on to a different position on the tape. Here we have very well defined inputs to the computation and outputs being the tape, uh, a very well defined algorithm which are the update rules of the program and a terminating condition. At some point uh, the program, well, hopefully will hold. The big question is, does this help us understand brains, biological brains? And I'm not sure that there's really a very clear way we can take this view of computation in the computer science sense and apply it to computation in the natural world. Melanie Mitchell, one of the very big figures in complex systems, uh, said that the language of dynamical systems may be more useful than the language of computation if we want to understand uh, 
computation in, uh, in biological systems. And that's a viewpoint that I very much agree with. So kind of moving along to, to think about computation in, in uh, complex systems from a dynamical systems point of view. We can think about information processing occurring in, in any complex system. Here I've drawn a complex system as a brain, but you can think here about uh, fish in a school or, or ants foraging as well as, uh, as, as parts of a complex system. And I should just briefly uh, define uh, what I mean by a complex system for those who haven't come across the term. Uh, complex system science refers to the study of, of large systems of, of interacting entities where the system level behavior is some non-trivial result of, uh, of the interactions at the microscopic level. So here obviously brains fit, fit that description. And, and so here we're thinking about how is information processed here? So we can, we can talk about, uh, we can talk about uh, the brain or whichever system it is starting off in some initial state where the elements of the system have some initial condition represented by the colors uh, on the left diagram here. And so uh, by taking into account the current state of the system and inputs, the system undergoes some dynamical process or a transient in a dynamical system sense through time where those individual parts of the system interact uh, and change their, change their states uh, before reaching some, some final state. Uh, and there are outputs along the way. So the final state here may not be a, an attractor of the system. It may be just some, some stop point that we've sampled the system at, of course. So we can basically say, just to summarize that view from, from this dynamical systems perspective, I would say that intrinsic information processing occurs whenever a complex system undergoes some dynamical process that changes its initial state and inputs into some later state and outputs. And that's a very inclusive view uh, of what computation is. Uh, we can think about intrinsic computation as uh, in many, many areas of, of uh, the world around us. We can talk about information processing in the brain, of course. We can talk about time evolution of cellular automata or gene regulatory networks computing cell behavior, flocks computing collective heading, ants computing the most efficient routes to food, or even, as I say, there's a very inclusive view, so we can think about the universe computing its own future. What we want to do, though, is to make these notions of information processing in complex systems more precise. To quantify how information is being processed, that's what we have to do. So Mitchell goes on to, to phrase uh, four different questions that we can ask uh, in, in order to, to try and make these notions precise. She says that we could ask about how information is represented by the system. So in a brain, obviously, it's represented in the spiking patterns across the neurons and how they're structured. We could talk about how information is read and written by the process. Uh, for a brain, obviously, that's going to be uh, uh, read in terms of sensory inputs <coughs> and, and written in terms of uh, uh, motor outputs. How is the information processed? Uh, so that's getting at how is it uh, that the parts of the system are actually interacting? What, what are they doing in that interaction to process that information to change their states? And we can ask how does the information acquire functional or purpose or meaning. So in terms of the brain here, we can think about, uh, we can think about evolutionary views of, of what the meaning of, of that information might be. So I want to focus on the third question here. How is the information processed? So to look at uh, this dynamic transient from an initial state to a final state and look inside the system at what is actually happening in the interaction between the components or, or in the brain, what's actually happening in the interaction between the neurons. How is it that they're updating their state as a function of time? And how can we quantify what they're doing? Uh, how can we quantify that uh, under a, a view of information processing? The way that we do that uh, is to first of all look at how computation in complex systems is discussed. And it's typically discussed in terms of memory and signaling and processing. In all of these systems, we, we talk about these kinds of operations on information. We can talk about, we can talk about uh, the memory uh, or in, in a gene regulatory network, for example, in terms of how it's holding it, its state. We can talk about signaling between neurons in the brain. We can talk about processing when uh, the fish in a, in a school make a, a decision to change direction, for example, to avoid a predator. So these concepts come up throughout all these kinds of computation. And so what we want to do is to quantify computation in a way that aligns with the way we, we talk about computation qualitatively. So what we want to do is we want to quantify how information is stored, uh, 
how it's transferred and how it's modified, with the idea being that if we can quantify intrinsic computation in the language that's normally described and qualitatively, if we can quantify that, then it should help us to understand how nature computes and, in fact, why it's complex. So what I'm going to do in this talk is start off describing to you how we, how we make this quantification. Uh, and that's what we call, uh, that's the approach that we call information dynamics. So we'll start out with about half the talk looking at uh, the measures that we use there and what they mean. And then in the back half, we'll, we'll get to some applications, uh, a way I've kind of classified um, how this can be useful in, in computational neuroscience, for example. But the same classification can apply to, to other complex systems, of course, as well. Okay. So to understand uh, this view of how information is processed in, in the transient of a, of a complex system, we want to focus on, on the question of how is the next state of a variable in a complex system computed? So we want to look at a complex system, uh, complex systems where we can model them as a multivariate time series here. So in our system, we can think about it being a large collection of some entities, which may be neurons in a brain, that could be uh, beamform sources from an MEG experiment, it could be uh, uh, equities in a financial market. Uh, but whichever kind of system we're looking at, we're thinking about systems where these entities have a time series of behavior. So, uh, so if it was a, a beamform sources in MEG, this would be the time series of activity on those sources. If there are equities in a financial market, it would be the price of those equities through time, for example. And we want to think about how we can quantify the interactions between those entities in terms of information processing. So here what we want to do is we want to focus on, on single points here. We want to focus on one variable x and look at its next time step and think about how that, the value at that ne next time step is the output of a local computation within the system. So all the elements in the system are undertaking their own local computations and we can break each one of them down in a way that we can understand how the information is being stored, transferred and modified. So the key questions that we're asking here are where does the information uh, in this variable come from and how can we measure uh, the contributions of those sources to the information processing event here. In particular we're going to ask about how much of that information was stored, how much was transferred and can we partition these, do they overlap and so on. So in particular as I say we're going to look at measuring storage, transfer and modification. We're going to be looking at state updates of the target variable so we're thinking about this value as, a, as an update. If it's a computational process in, in variable x, we're thinking about how it updates itself through time. And in particular, we also want to look at the dynamics of these measures in space and time. So again, as I say, we're coming very much from a dynamical systems perspective. So we want to think about the dynamics of these measures, not just talk about uh, an average measure of influence of, of variable y on variable x, but how that fluctuates through time. And then we can relate that back to the dynamics of the system and it, it should help us to understand what the system is doing in more detail. So uh, in order to do that, we're ob hopefully obviously going to turn to information theory. Uh, so if we want to talk about quantifying information in, in whichever way, information theory is where we should be turning. And as uh, Victor and I have been talking about uh, earlier today, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be giving this talk in the place where uh, Shannon was, uh, was, a, was a student and a, and a teacher as well. Uh, it's quite an honour to, to be doing that because his work has been obviously so influential on mine. Now, we don't really have time to give a crash course in information theory. Uh, I will give a very quick overview. Uh, can I just see a show of hands? Who, let's, let's ask, this, ask the question this way. Who doesn't know anything about information theory? That's okay, that's okay. So I'm not going to be able to cover everything, obviously. Uh, and uh, there's quite a, I guess, quite a run up to understand the latter half of the talk, but let me give you a very quick overview here. Uh, information theory gives us a way to understand, uh, firstly, uncertainty. So the, the fundamental, fundamental measure here is the Shannon entropy. That quantifies how much uncertainty we have about uh, a variable in a system, a question we might be asking, uh, or a measurement. So, for example, we could ask the question, what's the sex of the next person to walk through that door? We have uncertainty about what the answer to that is going to be. Could be male, could be female, we don't know. Information theory allows us to quantify that and we quantify that uncertainty in bits. So if, the, if we've got an equiprobable distribution of a man or a woman walking through that door next, that's one bit of uncertainty that we have. 
The flip side of uncertainty is uncertainty reduction, and that's what we call information. If you tell me who's gonna walk through that door before they walk through, or even after, that reduces my uncertainty about, that, about the answer to that question. Okay, if you tell me who it is, that reduces my uncertainty by a full one bit. That's a provision of information, an uncertainty reduction. An uncertainty reduction doesn't have to be a full uncertainty reduction. You could have a, a scout for me out there who uh, doesn't just tell me, that doesn't necessarily tell me the sex of the person to walk through, but tells me the color of their shoes. You know, I've got a gentleman walking in right now, he's wearing black shoes. Uh, so that gives me some information. If I don't look at the, the person there, that gives me some information about uh, <laughs> whether it's male or female. Uh, men typically wear black and brown shoes, right? Women are more creative than us in general. I don't mean to generalize, but you know, honestly, that's true. Uh, if you told me the person that was about to walk through was wearing bright red shoes, it's probably not a man. It could be, uh, but you know, if we look at a posterior distribution of the, the probability of the person walking through given they've got red shoes, it's more likely to be a woman. You can argue with me, but let's just, uh, let's just say that's right. So that reduces my uncertainty <laughs> if I find out the shoe color. That's, an, that's information, it's an uncertainty reduction. And that's what we mean by uh, mutual information here. We can talk about both of, those contexts in, uh, both of those concepts in the context of another variable. So we can, talk about, uh, we can talk about uncertainty in the context of what I already know. So we could, we could say, if I already know the shoe color, how uncertain am I still? about the sex of the person. We could also, uh, we could also have another piece of information, uh, say whether the person's wearing earrings or not, after I already know what shoe color they've got. And then we can talk about the uncertainty reduction from knowing if they're wearing earrings, given the context of what I already know from their shoe color. So that would be a conditional provision of information. Without getting to the maths, that's your two to three minute overview of, of, of the concepts we're studying in information theory. And we're gonna focus on these measures of information. Is that okay? Okay, cool. All right, so coming back to the main thread of the talk, as I say, we're, we're interested in measuring uh, how information is stored, how it's transferred and how it's modified uh, in, in the local computation within a system. The first measure I want to consider is how information is stored. And here we're simply going to look at how much information we have about this next value of variable x that we can find from the past here. So there we're going to take a straight mutual information between a past vector of our time series and the very next value here. And this is what we call active information storage. So here in an uh, in equation, I, I've represented it as a mutual information between the past vector and the next value here. So it's an average information from the past that we can use in predicting the next value. What's really important here is that this is not saying that that information causally remains within that variable. That information could be uh, going out from variable X via some feedback loop into another variable and coming back later. Okay, so it's, it's not causal. What it is doing is modeling from our perspective how the information is being processed. Okay, so it doesn't matter that it's not causal. From our perspective of looking at the time series, this is, a, this is a, a, a model of how the information may be being stored that aligns with how we see the system. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, if any of you are familiar with information theory and complex systems, this aligns very much with the view of the Crutchfield group on uh, exocentropy uh, and statistical complexity. Uh, this active information storage measure is basically a lower bound or a, a low order component of those, uh, of those quantities. We look at a lower order component only because we're only interested from this perspective of looking at the computation of this next variable. Whereas those related measures are looking at uh, information held about the entire future that's not necessarily in use right now for computing the next variable. So neither is better or worse, they're just used for different purposes, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is how we're gonna quantify uh, information storage. What we can do also is we can quantify how that information is being stored at every point in time throughout our process. This is what we call a local uh, active information storage, also known as a point-wise information storage. Uh, this is an approach that you may not be so familiar with from information theory. Point-wise measures uh, are measures that are related specifically to, uh, to one realization. So normally in information theory, we talk about an average. We talk about an average entropy or an average information value which says on average for two variables how much information am I going to get from one realization of x about one realization of y. Here 
we're talking, uh, we're talking about specific realizations. So, uh, so let's forget information storage for a moment. Let's, let's think about mutual information in general. We could talk about the information that a weather report provides you about uh, whether it's going to rain or not. Now, uh, the, the mutual information uh, up here is simply, uh, is simply an average over a log ratio of uh, a prior probability on whether it's going to rain, sorry, a, a prior probability of, of, over whether it's going to rain versus a posterior probability of whether it's going to rain given uh, what the weather report said. A pointwise measure doesn't look at an average over that. It looks at the individual realizations. So we can ask, for the weather report I got today, that realization, what does that tell me about whether it rains today in this specific realization? And that's just the log ratio of those specific prior and posterior probabilities. So uh, dealing on this pointwise level, that probability ratio can be uh, greater than one or less than one. That means is if what we learnt from the weather report increases our likelihood, uh, increases our likelihood of what actually happened. So if the weather report says it's sunny, you know, our expectation of it being sunny increases compared to our prior of whether it's going to be sunny or rainy. If it turns out that it actually is sunny, then uh, when we evaluate our posterior, we get a higher probability of it being sunny compared to, sorry, a higher posterior probability compared to uh, our prior. However, the weather report may say it's sunny and it actually rains. In that case, the probability that it rained, given <coughs> the weather report saying it was gonna be sunny, is actually less than our, our prior expectation on whether it was gonna rain. So we, it turns out we get a negative information value there, which we can interpret to say that uh, the weather report was misinformative about whether it rained today. Now those negative values kind of go away in the average. When we talk about averages in information theory, we don't get negative values. When we talk at the pointwise level, we do, but they're actually meaningful. So here, coming back to our perspective of, of information storage, when we look at these local values, we can get both strong positive values, telling us there was a strong influ uh, perceived influence of the past on the next value, we get strong positive values there, but we can also get negative values when looking at the past misinforms us about what was going to happen next. And that normally happens if there's a strong influence from, from our neighbours and, and the past uh, was simply uh, not useful to look at in, at that case. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's have a look at what we get from this in, in a, an example. So a, a classic canonical complex system, a cellular automata. Uh, now let me have another show of hands. Who, who knows cellular, who doesn't know cellular automata? Okay, it's enough that I'll give a quick introduction. Okay, so cellular automata are a classic complex system. What we've got, uh, what we've got here, we're looking at elementary cellular automata. So we have a dimensional array of cells, each of which are interacting with one cell only on either side. And uh, they're gonna use a binary deterministic rule to each update their next value. So this, this white one here will update itself to be black at the next time step based on the value of uh, themselves and then they one either side. And all the cells are updating themselves in exactly the same way. They're a classic uh, complex system because even though they're so simple, we can get some really interesting emergent uh, behavior and emergent structures come out of uh, the dynamics of these, uh, of these cellular automata. So here we've got a rule known as uh, uh, and what happens here is that when we, let, uh, when we let the cellular automata run in time, we get some emergent structures coming out. Now this doesn't happen for many cellular automata rules. Most of them go to a sort of a, a uniform state or something that's, that's fixed very quickly. But a few of them give the, this sort of really interesting behavior. So here, CA has uh, these sorts of structures appearing. We call these blinkers, uh, structures that are static in, time, in, in space, sorry, so you can see there that these structures repeat in time going down the page, but they don't move in space. We have background domains, which are spatio-temporal patterns that are in the background filling in the gaps kind of between these structures. We also have uh, uh, domain walls, I guess, between, uh, between these background structures. So if you, trace, uh, if you trace one cell down here, you'll see sort of a pattern of two black, two white, two black, two white, two black, two white, Two black, two white, one black. So the pattern breaks here. 
and there's actually a, a moving breakage of that pattern. So these, these emergent structures are what got people very interested in, in cellular automata in the first place, and there were a lot of views on uh, how cellular automata compute, uh, which came from uh, the, the conjectures on how they can from various angles, including actually setting them computational tasks like classifying uh, the density of, of initial conditions and, and wanting the, the CAs to come to a, an all black or all white state at the end, depending on what was in the majority, and looking at what kind of rules can compute that okay. So coming out of a lot of the early working complex systems, conjectures on how information was processed in these systems. And the conjecture was that the, uh, the static blinker structures were information storage entities, because you can look at a point down here and make a pretty good prediction about what came in the past. So too were the background domains, but that the moving glider structures seem to be transferring information uh, from one point to another. If, if you followed that break in the, uh, in the background dynamics across here, if you find the break down here, well that tells you something about where the break had been a few time steps back. So applying this measure of information storage allowed us to quantify those conjectures. So what we've got on the right hand diagram here uh, is a space time, uh, a space time plot of these values of local information storage using the measure that we looked at on the previous slide. So at every point in space and time here we can write down uh, a number of bits that we can model as having been stored at that point, at that cell at that point in time. So here blue is representing strong information storage. We get strong information storage at these uh, blinker structures, we get strong information storage in the background domains as well. We get negative information storage at the glider structures, the, the moving entities that break up the domains. That negative storage there tells us that the background domain was no longer, it was misinformative about what came next. Looking at the background domain when it got broken, normally it would suggest that the background domain would continue, but at the gliders that doesn't happen. So looking at the, the, the previous values in the domain was misinformative about what was coming next. What's important here is that the strong information storages in the, in the blinkers in the background uh, align with all the conjecture about how information was being processed in these CAs. So that's a kind of validation uh, that, we're on, that we're using the right measure to align with how people are talking about information storage in complex systems. In a similar fashion then we can move on uh, to look at information transfer. So here we're going to use a measure called uh, transfer entropy, which quantifies how much information about this transition in our target variable can be found in some source variable. And that is simply a conditional mutual information. It's looking at how much information from our source about the target in the context of what we already know from the target past. Okay, so it's an average information from the source. It helps us predict the next value in the context of that past. And we can write down, uh, we can write down an equation that shows that our, our information storage term and our transfer entropy term are complementary when we're breaking down all the information that it takes to predict the next value of our, of our target here. They're complementary, they don't overlap. And that's because of the, the conditioning that we're doing here on the target pass that makes sure that we split out storage and transfer properly. For our measure of information transfer here, we can also look at that uh, on this same pointwise or local perspective. So again, we can get, uh, we, can, we can pull out the dynamics of how information is transferred through the system in space and time. We can look at every, every target point throughout the system and look at uh, the dynamics here, attribute the information to our, our sources. So that's the local transfer entropy. And applying that to cellular automata again allows us to do further quantification of the conjectures about how information processing is taking place here. So on the left diagram here, we're looking at uh, how information is flowing to the right. So how it's flowing from uh, a cell on the left to uh, a cell on the right at the next time point. And as we can see here, uh, these glider structures, which are uh, the breakages in the background domain, the glider structures which are moving to the right are highlighted very strongly as information being transferred to the right. And vice versa, the glider structures that are moving to the left are highlighted strongly as information transfer moving to the left. So again, this is a nice validation that transfer entropy uh, is aligning with the way that people talk about uh, information pr uh, transfer in, in a wider view of information processing in complex systems.
for both of these, uh, these measures, information storage and transfer, the results that I'm showing can be generated from my uh, open source toolkit, which if we have time at the end, I'll give you a quick demonstration of. Okay, so just to, to round out that part of the talk, as I said at the start, we, we, are, we are aiming to find information processing as, as storage, transfer and modification. We won't get to modification today, we'll just stick with storage and transfer. We picked these operations on information because they align with the way that information processing is discussed in complex systems. But it has some other nice features as well, uh, in, including uh, that this allows us to focus on a local scale of dynamics in space and time. As I showed you with the, uh, the cellular automator, we can see uh, we can see this sort of filtered view. It's like putting on a pair of information sunglasses and we can see how the information is being stored, how it's being transferred as, uh, as we go across space and across time. What's also important uh, from information theory is that uh, it allows us to model these computational quantities in a way that captures nonlinearities. So if, if you compare this to looking at uh, correlations, for example, we get nonlinearities, which is really good. And also, it's applicable uh, across any kind of It doesn't matter if we're looking at uh, discrete value data. So most of what we've looked at already was uh, just thinking about discrete value data, but we can uh, evaluate the same measures on continuous value data, like what we would have from uh, beamformed MEG sources, for example. There are good estimators for these quantities that work uh, with that kind of data as well. Uh, and even spiking time series, uh, we can kind of take a, a continuous time uh, perspective on those and, and we've got uh, new work that's come out recently showing how to uh, how to adapt these measures to work in continuous time for example. Okay so that kind of closes out uh, our first half of the talk on I guess the, the philosophy and the quantitative framework of how we study information processing uh, in complex systems in general. And that's all nice and obviously I, I like it very much but in the end if it doesn't actually tell us anything new about, comp about uh, computation in complex systems that we see in the world around us, then who cares? So in the second part, I wanna move on to show you what you can actually do with this on, uh, uh, in com computational neuroscience <coughs> as an example domain. And I've classified that in, in three different ways here, I guess. Now, um, I'm gonna pick a couple of key examples for each obviously other things we've done under these categories as well that, that I won't get to, but I'm going to pick a couple of uh, examples for each that kind of demonstrate what I mean. So the first category is uh, that looking at these measures of information processing will allow us to characterise different regimes of behaviour. So what I mean there is can we do something about what's different about information processing in subjects with one brain con condition compared to uh, control subjects? Or can we say uh, what's different about subjects undertaking one cognitive task compared to another? How does the information processing change and how does that help us to understand the dynamics of what's taking place here? Speaking of dynamics then, uh, we can then drill into, uh, into those uh, operations on information on a spatiotemporal scale. Just like what we looked at with the cellular automata, we can look at uh, brain dynamics across space and time and look at how these measures of, of operations on information are fluctuating across space and time. And what does that tell us about how the cognitive task is unfolding, how it's changing uh, over space and through time, and how does that relate to the cognitive task? Thirdly, we can use the measures to relate network structure to function. So which are the areas where the hotspots are, how, they with, how they're connected, and so on. And also, can we use the measures to actually infer structure uh, as well. So let's, uh, let's dig into these. Let's dig into these. So the first area I want to look at is characterizing behavior and responses in terms of neural processing. And as I say, the, the, the classic question here is how do subjects with different neural conditions process information differently? Uh, and a, an experiment that kind of fits that well is a study that we did looking at uh, autism spectrum disorder subjects. Uh, so this was in collaboration with the, uh, the Vibra Lab in Frankfurt. They're, they're my key collaborators in computational neuroscience. Does anyone know Mikhail Vibra here? No? Okay. You should. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what they did was they, they did uh, uh, a, a, an MEG study looking at, uh, this was just looking at resting state behaviour of, of uh, ASD subjects 
versus controls and looking at okay, what can we say is different about how information is being processed. And in particular here, we looked at uh, the measure of information storage because the, the hypothesis was that you know, looking at uh, looking at ASD subjects, there was a, some suggestions that there was more bottom-up processing than top-down, as well as uh, that there seemed to be reduced use or, or preci precision in, in priors uh, in the way that uh, the macroscopic behaviour especially um, uh, was seen. So the hypothesis was that uh, given that case of uh, reduced use or precision of priors, less information being stored. Uh, you know, less, there's less predictability in behaviour from past about the future. So can we quantify that uh, from the brain, brain imaging data? And it turns out we can. So what we did was we looked at comparing simply the average information storage uh, in different brain areas between, uh, between the ASD subjects and controls. And we managed to highlight some significant differences in a couple of different regions from a few different studies. So in the hippocampus as well as precuneus, posterior cingulate cortex and supramarginal gyrus. Um, now what's, what's interesting there is that it aligns with the, the hypothesis that it, it appears that the subjects uh, have, have lower use or, or, or lower precision in their use of priors in, in determining behaviours. And, and we see that uh, at the neural level here, or well, at the, uh, the MEG level, which is really interesting. Furthermore, uh, furthermore, we saw that the information storage values uh, uh, correlated negatively with uh, symptom severity. So the more strongly the subjects were uh, uh, displaying ASD symptoms, the less information was being stored uh, in the neural dynamics. Also of interest was that you couldn't see this effect if you just looked at signal power or if you just looked at autocorrelation time. So it appears to be a highly nonlinear effect uh, and, and an effect that's highly encoded in, in the patterns of neural activity rather than the level of neural activity in these cells. I should also point out that uh, these are the areas that came through some pretty rigorous statistical controls. Uh, we think that if we can do larger studies with more statistical power, that more uh, areas are, are, are going to show up here. You know, if we look at the average across the brain, uh, the average also is much lower, is, is significantly lower in ASD subjects. Uh, so we think that there's more there and, and a larger study should hopefully uh, reveal more about what's happening here. Okay, I'm going to skip the next one. We're going to move to uh, the second area that I want to talk about, which is a space-time characterization of information processing. So ASD subjects, we're just talking about information storage on average. Uh, during, during the resting state behaviour. Here I want to drill in to what's happening throughout uh, the cognitive processing to highlight information processing hotspots and use those dynamics of information to try and explain the dynamics of what's taking place. The classic example I showed you already with cellular automata and we've used this in, in other classic complex systems like uh, flocking behaviour or swarming uh, for example. So a couple of experiments that I'll highlight fairly quickly here. So one is looking at uh, looking at the local transfer entropy through, uh, through a button pushing task. So this was a, a free choice experiment where the subject could choose to press a left or a right uh, <coughs> button and we looked at simply uh, a very simple measure of how uh, information was flowing from planning regions to motor execution uh, and looking at the differences between uh, the flows for uh, different motor areas for button presses and we, get, we see very very clear differences between the two kinds of trials here. As you can see uh, in the middle here, we start seeing a difference so it's not significant uh, before the push. And you know, right around the push, we get very strong differences in information flow uh, between these, these regions. And again, it's something that shows up so much from, uh, from raw activity. Uh, the earlier work on this, this was in collaboration with the John Dylan Haynes group from Berlin. Uh, so the early work that they had done here was looking at decoding uh, the left or the right press from different brain regions. Uh, and, and they were using a very sophisticated uh, spotlight search and, and machine learning technique to try and decode uh, the button presses from, uh, from individual uh, regions. Uh, so here, looking at the flow between those regions, we see something just as strong, uh, but without needing to go to that uh, 
uh, such, a, such a sophisticated searching procedure. The next experiment I'll show you is looking at uh, information storage dynamics in the, uh, the visual cortex of a cat. So this was from voltage sensitive dye imaging this time. Uh, so here uh, we're looking at a, a 2D, uh, a 2D uh, voltage sensitive dye image where we have now converted the raw activations in that image into uh, values of information storage. So here uh, now red is very strong information storage and blue is uh, negative, strongly negative. What's happening here is we're giving, uh, the, the cat is watching a, 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 2D, uh, a 2D image of moving dots. And so the dots are moving and then at time zero, we change the pattern. And what we see here is how the cat's visual cortex is reacting to that pattern change. So as I say, at zero milliseconds, we've changed the pattern. What we see here is that just after uh, that zero milliseconds, the whole visual cortex floods with misinformation. We can see, we can literally see with our information sunglasses, the cat being confused about what it's seeing. Uh, what it had seen in the past and what it was predicting was no longer helping it uh, to predict the, the stimulus that was about to come in and change its activity. Through time, as the cat locks onto the stimulus, we see the information storage values increase uh, and then plateau as the cat starts to lock on uh, to the patterns in that stimulus. So that, that, that's very interesting. Uh, again here, uh, if you just look at the raw, uh, the raw activity, the raw activity uh, in the cortex, you can't pick up these different, but the raw activity doesn't show it. It's specific to the, uh, the, temporal, the temporal patterns that we, we see as information storage uh, in the visual cortex here. So again, we're seeing something with this information processing view that we can't see from raw activation levels alone. Okay, the last uh, one that I want to show you in this set about space-time characterization uh, is to, uh, to investigate uh, predictive coding. So here, what, what we're really doing is looking at using our, our view on information processing to validate conjectures about how information is processed in the brain. Now, I notice I'm starting to, to run towards the end of time, so I'll, uh, I'll go through this one very quickly, even though it is rather subtle. Uh, so predictive coding makes some fairly specific, uh, specific predictions about what we should see um, in the interaction between uh, higher and lower uh, layers uh, in, a hierarchy, in a neural hierarchy. Here we looked at a Mooney face and house detection experiment. So, so Mooney faces are those that are uh, you know, uh, monochromatic and, and, and lit from one direction and, and they're a bit hard to, to pick out. So this is a real face, this is kind of a scrambled one. So we're asking, uh, we're priming the subject detect a face and we'll show them one of these or one like this and ask them is it a face or not fairly quickly. Uh, we'll ask them to respond if it's a face or not fairly quickly thereafter. We also have trials with houses. So uh, we'll ask them is it a house or not and then show them one and they have to say yes or no. So if we, if we look at this experiment through a, uh, uh, the lens of prediction and then think about what it says about information processing it makes some fairly specific predictions. It suggests that when we prime the person, when we tell them it's a face task, then in, in areas that are specific to faces, the higher level layers should formulate that prediction and send it downwards. So we should see a transfer of information downwards here uh, from the higher face processing areas to the lower ones. And then that prediction is gonna have to be stored in those lower, uh, in those lower, lower, those lower layers while they, while they wait for the sensory input. If that's the case then, we should see an increase in performance if more information is being stored. If, if, if the information about the is stored poorly, then presumably the person will perform, uh, won't perform as well on the task. And that's exactly what, what we saw in the experiment. That in the face trials, when we prime the person about the face, we do see a larger transfer of information here in these areas from the higher layer to the lower one than we do in the house trials. We do see larger information storage in those lower layers and we do see a correlation to performance. So this provided some of the first uh, uh, quantification uh, uh, to go towards validating uh, these conjectures from uh, predictive coding, which was quite interesting. Okay, the last area that I want to, to talk about fairly briefly since we're almost out of time is to look at relating network structure to function. So here, uh, taking a very general complex systems view first, uh, the, the structure function question is of interest in all kinds 
of, uh, of complex systems, not just brain networks. So we want to know what, it, what is it about you know, the types that we see in all kinds of complex systems that, you know, that make them so common. You know, what is it they do? We know how to build small world networks. We know how to build scale-free networks. Why are they so common? What are they doing? And we think that a characterizing information processing is the, the right way that we can get an answer to that that's general across very different kinds of networks. Uh, so in brief, as I say, since we're almost out of time, uh, this is a quick, this is a, a very theoretical result that's not so much from neuroscience. This is a study of a phase transition in random Boolean networks where we can, uh, what we've done here is we've, we've started out with um, a very regular ring for, with low values of randomization of the, the links. So we've got a very regular, almost lattice-like network. And we gradually randomize the links until the network is, is completely random. When we do that, we drive the dynamics in the system from, uh, from fairly ordered through to, to very random. And we quantify that with a measure of damage or variability in damage spreading here. So this point here is, is uh, if you will, it's kind of giving an analogy to a, 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 critical, uh, a critical point in the dynamics. What we see is that the very, uh, the very regular networks at this side here, they have very strong information storage compared to the random networks where there's not much information being stored at all. And that's because information storage is supported by the clustered structure in these networks. On the other hand, if we look at how information is being transferred in these networks, we see very strong transfer of information where the network becomes more random because the long links that we see in the network as we're randomizing it serve to transfer a lot of information across the different parts of the system. Around the small world regime, sort of in the middle here, we see a very nice balance uh, a very nice balance between the two, which suggests that uh, from an information processing point of view, small world networks may be very useful because they're balancing these two very important operations on information. And if you want to uh, support general purpose computation, you really need to have both present there. So lastly, uh, la the last thing I want to show you is looking at inverting, uh, inverting the structure function uh, the structure function relationship. So what if we have uh, time series data from our nodes, but we don't know what the structural relationship is? What can we infer? And I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with the split between trying to infer structural networks, functional networks, or, uh, or in the middle, effective networks, or what Spawns has recently called uh, communication dynamics. So we're looking at the effective connectivity here or, or communication dynamics. We're looking at inferring minimal neural circuit model that can explain the dynamics. So this is not structural, and you know, we're not we're not we're not going to claim that it's causal, but it's probably got a, a pretty strong relationship, uh, you know, because that causal network is what's giving giving rise to uh, the relationships we're seeing here. Uh, it, it, it's more it's a better model, I think, than than functional because we've got a directed relationship, and we're really what we're in particular trying to do is is look at uh, the multivariate effects from multiple sources to one target here. We've got a new toolkit out uh, that brings together some previous open source software that we have. So it brings together my open source software with some other software from the bid uh, It performs, as I say, we're looking at multivariate influence, trying to infer the set of parents for a particular target. I won't go into the, uh, the algorithms. Obviously, we don't really have time for that. But the software is out. And if you're interested in doing effective connectivity analysis and taking multivariate effects into account, I can highly recommend that you check it out. So let's, uh, let's finish off. I uh, just had some quick results to show how it's, it's being validated nicely, but we'll skip over that. Uh, so what I've done in this talk, I've first of all given you an overview of how we look at information processing in complex systems in terms of how information is stored, transferred, and modified. And it's something that we can do on a local scale in space and time to look at the dynamics of information processing. This means that we can now quantify all of these operations. We don't have to rely on conjecture anymore. As I showed you, we, we sort of validated these measures from a very theoretical perspective in cellular automata, but they're also highly applicable to real data in, in a computational neuroscience setting. In this setting, I've kind of classified uh, the different things that you can use these measures for in terms of characterizing differences between regimes in behavior, looking at space-time characterizations of how the dynamics of information processing unfold, as well as relating network structure to function. Uh, so as we move into question time, let me just say a quick thanks to the many collaborators on this talk, in particular Vibral Lab in Germany and the Australian Research Council for the major funding uh, behind a lot of this work. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah. Any questions? Um, so a lot of times in computational neuroscience will make models very similar to what you're describing, kind of either a point process model or some kind of autoregressive multivariate Gaussian model. And and then people will talk about, you know, how much of the variance of the neural data is explained by uh, the stimulus or whatever it might be. Um, so I guess, do you think that, I mean, for one, there must be, there should be an easy relationship at least between, say, transparency free and variance explained. Yeah. And then, what value do you think this adds over and above that kind of analysis? Yeah. Uh, okay, so there are a few parts to that question. I'll, I'll repeat. I'll repeat parts of it as I go for the, the purpose of the recording. So the question was, in neuroscience, something that's very common is looking at uh, how different sources can be used to reduce uh, the variance about uh, the, the, the target they're predicting. And how do these measures relate to those? Uh, the answer is fairly strongly. You can view these measures in some sense as a, a nonlinear extension of those. For example, uh, you're familiar with the Granger causality uh, as kind of probably the, the wi most widely used measure in that sense. So the Granger causality is actually a, a direct linear analog of the transfer entropy. So the Granger causality looks at building a model of our target here in terms of contribution from the past first, then adds to that model what we we add the source to that model and looks at the differences in in uh, in variance as uh, uh, as kind of the, the Granger causality there. Um, so it, it's a direct linear an analog. You can show that if the dynamics here were truly linear. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the transfer entropy and the Granger causality. So the difference comes in two ways. Firstly, it comes in in that difference between uh, that those measures are only picking up a linear relationship, whereas these are completely non-linear in general. Now, uh, you can, of course, pl plug in behind the scenes a linear estimator and, and do everything the same. Uh, if you want to go to a, a, a non-linear estimator, <laughs> Uh, that's harder, it requires more data and it takes more time to process, but it's more powerful. You can pick up much more about uh, what you're seeing in, in the dynamics. Uh, and there are um, you know, many known cases where you do see more by taking that nonlinear view. Um, that's, that's one example. The other, the other example, I guess, is, uh, well, not example, the other perspective on that, you ask what, what does this give you that those kinds of analyses do not um, so partly it's the non-linearity, partly, partly I guess that this is a holistic framework. It's not to say that you can't build a framework like this out of those measures. Uh, it, it's not to say that you can't, I mean, you, you definitely can. You can plug in linear measures behind all of these and they still fit together in exactly the same way. And we can still talk about information storage and transfer from a linear perspective. Uh, I guess I'm just saying that having this, this whole framework of how they fit together and how we can understand them, that's something that's a little to what's usually done uh, in that setting as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. One more question? There it is. Uh, yeah, everything you've done requires estimating a lot of uh, additional probabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't say anything about how you actually do that. Is it a simple frequency ratio or is it... Something Bayesian going on, or whatever. Yeah, great, great question. While I'm answering that, let me let me show you something here. Uh, the framework of, of what we call storage and what we call transfer sort of applies regardless of how you do the actual estimation. That that's sort of a very theoretical view. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can estimate uh, these information theoretic quantities, and it kind of depends on the data that you have. So you can you can do uh, an estimation on discrete data. We do like a, a, just a, a straight up plug, plug in estimator where you compute your probabilities just based on counts of how many times you co observe samples in, uh, in, in the bins that you have for your data. If you want to stay in the continuous space, uh, there are a number of different estimators that you can use, uh, some, of which, uh, some of which will kind of give you an estimate of probability distribution functions along the way, some of which will go straight to the, uh, the, the, the final result. So let me show you some examples here. This is my open source toolkit, JODT. Just a question. You're, you're, you're some dynamics, then you take the whole data set mm -hmm. and you estimate the probabilities from that. Yeah. And then uh, you get your point estimates by going back and doing further analysis. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So the point estimates are evaluated for one sample, but they're evaluated based on the probability distribution.
distribution or density functions that we've estimated from all of the available data that we have. Uh, and as I say, you can, you can evaluate these estimates in different ways. Uh, and the JODT software uh, gives you a nice, easy uh, graphical user interface to do that. So you start up and say, I want to estimate transfer entropy. Then you can pick which type of estimate you're going to use. And I'd say that depends on your data set. You can choose a, a Gaussian estimator, which will uh, uh, be effectively like the Granger causality as we discussed just before. This Kraskov KSG estimator is, uh, is, a, is a probably the best of breed nonlinear estimator at the moment. You can pick out your data set. Uh, you can pick out your data set. You tell it which columns you want to compute the transfer entropy between. You set a whole lot of properties, which the, uh, uh, the GUI will tell you what each property is all about. And then you can press this button here to calculate. And you not only get an answer, but you get some sample code in Java and Python and MATLAB that you can take, uh, that you can take and expand on if you want to do something more complicated. So the actual estimates are hard to do, hard to get started with, but you've got good tools like this out there uh, that will help you get started in a very easy way and give you some, some sample code there. Do you have time for any more or should we wrap up? Unfortunately, we, we should wrap up, but I guess Joe will stay for a while. Sure. Uh, thank you.